Father, we thank you that your presence is already here. We thank you for that. We thank you for speaking to us this morning. Father, I'm so grateful. This morning, if you have your Bible, turn over to Colossians. Colossians chapter 1. I, I want to share with you this morning and talk to you about the blood of Jesus. This morning. You know, your value is determined by the currency of Jesus' blood. Chew on that for a while. No, I'm serious. I mean, think about that. That you and I, he values us so much that he gave the most precious thing that he could give. Man, if you're ever feeling sorry for yourself, that'd be a good thing to remember, wouldn't it? You know, when my wife, Nicole, <clears throat> and I were dating, it was, it was 1991. She lived in Phoenix, Arizona. I lived in Tulsa, Oklahoma, so we were 1,000 miles apart. And we had no social media. You know, we could write letters to one another. And we would call each other. I remember when she gave me her phone number for the first time, I was super excited to hear her voice, you know, because I, I hadn't spoken with her in four years. And so, you know, things can change in four years. You know? And uh, she wouldn't send me a picture, by the way. She, she kept teasing me with that. She finally sent me her picture. You know what it was? It, she, she taught a class, and she had her students draw a picture of her. And she sent, I still have them, like 32 crayon-drawn pictures of my wife. Anyway, but at the time, we, we uh, you know, we were, she gave me her phone number, and I called her for the first time. And I remember hearing her voice for the first time. And I remember we could talk on the phone for an hour a week. And then my phone bill at the end of the month was $400. It was 100 bucks, 100 bucks an hour. And you guys remember back in the day, back when cell phones you carried in a bag. They were, you know. And, and it was, what, three bucks a minute on the cell phone? So you're like... 
can we call you, you know, or whatever, maybe, you know, you had to talk real fast. And, but I remember hearing her voice and I remember how excited I was that I was by the phone waiting at 9.45 in the evening. We called every Friday at 10 p.m., 9.45. I was there in the room. Everything's done. Don't have to go to the bathroom. I mean, you know, <laughs> you got everything ready. Why? Because I'm getting ready to have an amazing conversation with the woman that I'm in love with. You guys remember what that was like, you know, and those of you that are married now, you remember those initial first dates that you had and just the excitement that you had? And it, it's this, man, when I think about the blood of Jesus and how precious it is, it's, almost, it's difficult to come up with words that really do it justice, that give it the value that it really deserves. And lately I've been reading about Ezra and Nehemiah. Ezra and Nehemiah, their, their lives are interesting because it was during a time when Israel was in captivity. You know, the Babylonians had come in, they'd taken them captive, and now the Persian uh, rule, they had come into rule. And Ezra had an interesting life because the king, I, th I believe it was Cyrus, who said, hey, I, I, I want you guys to go back to Jerusalem. I'm going to allow you to go back to Jerusalem. You can rebuild the house of God. Here's all the articles that King Nebuchadnezzar took from the house of God. We're going to give those back to you. you know, and he sent 44,000 of the Israelites back to Jerusalem. And I remember Ezra, it, it, what stood out to me when I was reading the other day was that he found out about some sin that was going on in the Levite, in the leaders, the, the, uh, the priests and the Levites, and there was sin that was taking place. And he began, when he heard it, he began to mourn. Not just cry, mourning is deeper than crying. He began to mourn because it hurt his heart. The closer I get to God, the more my heart begins to hurt for what hit. I know his heart hurts for, personally. And I was thinking about this and how he began to mourn. And uh, Nehemiah did the same thing. You remember when he found out about the wall being torn down and he found out about the gates that had been burned. He found out about how, how Israel was in complete shame and he began to mourn. They didn't just mourn for a few minutes, for a half hour, for an hour, even for a day. They mourned for days. Imagine mourning for days. Why are they doing that? Because their heart is so sensitive toward what God's heart is. Nehemiah realized the shame and the disgrace that had come on Israel. Well, each of them did the next thing. After they got done mourning, because Ecclesiastes says there's a time to cry. There's a time to mourn, right? But then there's a time to do something else. So then what did Nehemiah begin to do? He took ownership of what Israel had done, the sin that had led them, that had pulled them into captivity. He began to repent before God. He began to ask God to forgive him. He took ownership of the entire nation, took responsibility, and he began to ask God to forgive him. That's powerful. Nowhere did I, did I read about Nehemiah pointing the finger at a king, at a politician, at a government leader. It's not in there. You don't read about him criticizing. Well, if they hadn't have done this, we wouldn't be in this mess. There was no blame. He took full responsibility and he began to mourn for his nation. Man, imagine if we did that. If instead of watching the news and looking for ways that we could criticize, I got to tell you, I don't watch the news. I watch, the only news that I watch is victory news. And I'll tell you why. Because they pray at the end of the news. It's a half hour deal and they tell the stories, the, the big stories, but then they say, let's pray. And I go, oh, thank God. <laughs> somebody's, somebody's got the idea here. We need to pray. 
They don't just leave it there. They don't just tell you the, the bad news and leave it at that because we listen to bad news all the time and then it's real easy to go, you, you, them. It's because of that. It's because, it's because. Instead of, oh God. God, forgive us. We've stepped away. We as Christians, we've not lived out loud. We've not used our voice. We've not been a part. We've stepped out. We've handed it to other people. I repent. Why do we talk about voting? Why did we mention that in the announcements today? Because there's another step. There's the mourning that took place. Then there's the repentance. But then what's the next step? They took action. Ezra fixed the problem. Nehemiah went and fixed what was wrong. We can do the same thing. Hit our knees. And I don't know about you. I, I have, see, see my wedding ring right here? Underneath there, I don't know if you can see it, there's a little deal. That's a callus because I've worn the wedding ring for 30 years. <laughs> so, you know, anytime I pick stuff up, you know, you develop a callus. How many of you other guys have one of those? Yeah, yeah, all of us. All right, so right now, if, if I wasn't touching that with my hand that I can feel, I wouldn't be able to feel that. See, God, God said that he would take our heart of stone and give us a heart of flesh. Right now on this side, I have sensitive skin. And so I can feel my hand touching this part of the skin, but the callus, I can't. And so when we have a calloused heart, if you, if you were to take a pen and you were to push it down in that callus, I wouldn't feel it until you penetrated. Right? I wouldn't. But once you penetrated, it would be painful. And this is the way the calloused heart is. The calloused heart is, it takes longer to penetrate it and they don't feel it until it, and then, there's, then it's painful. But when we have a heart of flesh, we're sensitive to the Spirit of God and to His leadings and to His nudgings. I had a horse growing up. Her name was Duchess. And man, I could get on her, and all she had to feel was just the ever so slight pull of the rain on one side, and she knew I wanted her to move. Man, that's how I want to be. I want to be rain trained. That all I have to feel is God just nudging me in this direction. Like, okay, this is the way you want me to go, God. Be that car and drive. Amen. Wow. Sensitivity to the Spirit. We have, we have, <clears throat> let, me, let me say this differently. We have preached a gospel that is about us getting to go to heaven. And God is wanting, God preaches a gospel of wanting to bring heaven to earth. The Garden of Eden was God's original plan, but the enemy was able to get in and mess that up, right? But then what, when Jesus died on the cross, he restored everything. What does that mean, that he restored everything? That means that he brought heaven back to earth. This was his desire. And so the issue with the gospel being about people just getting to go to heaven is that people come to the altar, they pray a prayer, and they can pray a prayer, and they can still live discouraged, frustrated, and angry, and walk away from that. Why? Because heaven hasn't come to earth in their life. There's a transformation that needs to happen in the heart of every person, right? Okay, so God wants us to be transformed to the point that we begin to shine. That's why you were saved. What were you saved from? Just say some of the things that you were saved from. Sin? Addiction? Yeah. 
That's good stuff. And we were saved. But let me ask it this way. What were we saved for? To shine. To shine. I heard Bill Johnson share this. He was talking about his church and he was talking about how companies now call their church when they want to hire somebody. They call their church first. Why is that? And he found out that it was because of the culture that they bring to their company. How are they bringing culture? They're shining. Come on, we're, we're supposed to be a light in the darkness. We're supposed to be a beacon. Well, Phil, you don't understand. I, it's dark over at that company I work for. Yeah, that's why you're there. We don't have a darkness issue. We have a lack of light issue. Have you ever heard somebody say, hey, turn up the darkness, would you? No. No, you've heard people say, turn up the light. Come on, turn the light on. Make it shine bright. Phil, what does that mean? That means as you go, you're shining brightly for him. You're not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I, on Tuesday, we went to pick up a load in Tulsa. We have a, we have a warehouse um, that God has blessed us with, with brand new products that we're able to bless families in need. And actually yesterday, there was a family we found out about that had, they had been flooded and their apartment complex said, okay, your lease is, is over. So you guys need to go find a different place to leave, live because they had eight inches in the, ha- in the apartment. Now, I was in the Memorial Day flood back in 1984 in our home in Tulsa in Mingo Creek Valley, and we had 32 inches in our house. So I know what a flood is. I mean, you lose everything. Anything that's in the water, you might as well just send it away, burn it, whatever. And so she had lost everything, this mom, mom with two kids, and she was able to find a three-bedroom apartment, but... They moved in the apartment, but there's nothing in the apartment. They needed everything. So guess what we were able to do yesterday? We gave them a sectional. We gave them a, oh, it's a Thomasville. It's a nice one. I mean, it's got the big ottoman. We gave her a leather uh, Lazy Boy recliner. I'm talking with the two drink holders on each side and the little buttons. We gave her pots and pans and dishes. We gave her an air fryer. I mean, we loaded them up and it was so exciting to me because once we got done, we got to pray with the entire family. Her, her two kids got to pray with her parents and just love on them and bless them. Yeah, and they... They're invited to church. I told them where we have church and we would love to see them. But, but we're shining that way. So, so I, when I went to pick up the truck, I went to this uh, company. They, they, they do all kinds of different things, but Penske is one part of their company that they do. So I went there to pick up the truck. And as I'm standing there in the office working with the receptionist that's helping me, <clears throat> the owner of the company walks in and he's a buff Dude, I mean, he's all tatted up, and I mean, he's got six, eight pack, whatever you call it. I mean, he's just big. And he looks at me, and he gives me the head nod, you know? You guys know the nod, right? Okay. He gives me the head nod, and he says, what's the word? I said, Jesus is king, man. Yeah. And he goes, I would agree with that. <laughs> and, and then I, I, this just came out of me. I, I wasn't trying to manufacture anything. Thank God for Holy Spirit. And I just said, dude, I don't have any holes in my hands or my feet, so I'm doing great. Having a good day. And I had no idea what was going on with him. And he said, oh. He said, I was praying this morning. He said, because, he said, my guys installed a skylight in John Tyson's bathroom. He said, and they forgot to wipe off the suction cup rings. And John saw it. They called me. He said, now I got to figure out how to build three stories of scaffolding over a custom porcelain tub just so I can wipe out, you know, and he's kind of venting. And I said, well, you don't have any hands in your feet or hands, any holes. And he goes, no, I don't. Come on, we're supposed to shine. 
man, we don't apologize for being a Christian. Man, we stand blessed, thankful, and that thankfulness should pour over into the lives of the people that we're around. Amen? Oh, good. So you can shine at work. You can shine in your relationship with your spouse. Phil, how do I shine? Good way to shine with your spouse is to go low. Go low. Humble yourself. They owe you nothing. That should be the attitude that I have. And I can shine in my marriage. I don't care what state that you're at. This is not just for people that are having difficulty. This is for every marriage in here. You go low and you say, honey, I want you to know you owe me nothing. I told you guys a few weeks ago about how my wife looked at me and she said, I find no fault in you. Man, you want to make your spouse's day? That brought me to my knees. I started crying. Because <laughs> she knows me. Do you know what that word sozo means? Uh, sorry, saved. The Greek word is sozo. You know what that means? Saved, healed, delivered. Yeah. Yeah, let me give you the rest of the definition. To save, keep safe and sound. Rescue from danger and destruction. What about this? To save from suffering. Example, suffering from disease. To make well, to heal, to restore to health. This is a part of saved, right? And then to preserve one from danger and destruction, to save or to rescue. So God didn't just come to save us so that we could pray a prayer and we get to go to heaven. That wasn't the only reason that he came to save us, right? He came to sozo our life. And we talk a lot about deliverance. And the reason that we talk about deliverance is because we don't really fully believe that Jesus' blood was enough. It was his blood enough. Was it enough? No, I'm, I mean, really. Let me read Colossians to you. You're there in Colossians 1. Look at verse 13. It says, he has delivered us from the power of darkness and transferred us or conveyed us into the kingdom of the son of his love. See, people think that we're a product of what we've been through, but really we're a product of what we believe. So the thing that we have to work on more than anything is what we believe. What we think. Uh, what, uh, what our belief system is because your behavior comes out of your belief system. Listen, I'm, I'm not trying to get on deliverance ministries. That's not my heart, okay? Because I'm, we, we need them. But we don't, a person doesn't have to get delivered multiple times. Smith, uh, Smith Wigglesworth said it this way. He said, if you've prayed multiple times for the same thing, then every time you've prayed after once, you've prayed in doubt and unbelief. That's a strong word. Why? Because did you believe the first prayer? I heard Jerry Savelle tell this story, and I really connected with it because I, I loved slushies when I was a kid. You guys remember? Because... My generation, that was a big deal, right? Steve, you were in that generation. Slushies? Okay. Slurpees, yeah. They had different names for them. I'll go with slushy. You go with slurpee. No, but we, yeah. So, so anyway, the Jerry Savelle told this story about how they were getting ready to go. He was preaching at a church in a different town, and it was on a Sunday night, and he was driving. His wife was in the car, but his daughter was in the back seat. And his daughter asked him, she said, Dad, can we get a slushie? Can we stop and get a slushie? And he said, yes, we could stop and get a slushie, but we're going to do it after the meeting. You know, because she had her pretty little dress on, all the frills and everything, and didn't want it getting all sticky and getting everything on. And he said, so we'll get it after the meeting. And she said, okay. And so they drove a little further down the road. And then her daughter said, Dad, I thought we were going to stop and get a slushie. Are we going to get a slushie? He said, sweetheart, I told you, we're going to stop after the meeting. And I promise you, we will get a slushie after that. Okay. Well, then he said, we drove a little further. And then she said it again. Dad, I thought we were going to stop and get a slushie. Now, when are we going to get a slushie? He said, sweetheart, I told you. And he repeated it again. 
Well, finally, she said it one more time. Well, then he stopped the car. How many dads? Come on. He stopped the car. He said, sweetheart. He said, your dad told you that I promised I would get you a slushie, but not until after the meeting. So every time you ask me, when I told you that the first time, what you're doing is you're calling your daddy a liar by asking him multiple times. He said, as soon as I said it, the Holy Spirit said, yeah, me too. Mm, yeah, me too. So we pray the prayer of faith. Faith is what moves God. Faith is what pleases God. And we pray the prayer of faith. And then we step back and we stand in faith. My mom, as she had a massive heart attack, many of you know, back in 2011. And I remember I prayed for her right from the onset and laid my hands on her and I prayed for her. And when we took her to the hospital and we find, they finally they performed surgery on her, got her into the critical care unit, and dad and I walked to the waiting area. In my mind, I'm going, I'm going to pray all night. Why am I going to do that? What's my motive? Beg God. That was my motive. And I, I began to pray, and I always walk back and forth when I pray, man. I was beginning to pray in the Holy Spirit. I started walking this way and started to pray. My dad's sitting over here, and he said, Phil, you're not doing any good. Go home. I didn't feel very good. But, but before I could think about it, the Holy Spirit said, he's right. You've already prayed. Now stand. But what do we want to keep doing? What does our flesh want to keep doing? We want to keep Begging God, begging God, maybe this will move God. But what's the problem? I'm not praying in faith anymore. The first time I prayed was the prayer of faith. And now he said, stand. That was not easy. So you know what I did? I sat down. I said, God, you're going to have to show me how to stand. And I looked on that table. and never forget, I saw that Gideon Bible sitting there. And I began to look for scriptures that I could stand on. Sword of the Spirit, man. Sword of the Spirit. So, so generational curses are real, but I will say this. We have turned them into monsters. We've turned them into bigger than what they are. Would you agree with that? Okay. So here's what I mean. When Jesus died on the cross, he broke every curse. In fact, it says it in Galatians 3.13, it says, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us, for it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. So Jesus became the curse. What was cursed? The sin, the sickness, the disease, everything that was not of God that Jesus took on his body, that was cursed. You remember Moses in the wilderness that the people were being bit by the serpents, the snakes, and they were dying. They were starting to die. And Moses said, Lord, what do I do? And he said, I want you to make a bronze serpent. And I want you to stick it on a pole and hold it up where everybody could see it. So they made the serpent. He put it on the pole. He held it up. And he said, every person that looked upon it, they were healed. Why? Cursed is everything that hangs on a tree. So they looked and they saw the serpent on the pole and they realized God has cursed the serpent. So is Jesus, Becca, come help me. Is Jesus' blood enough to cover a generational curse? Do you think his blood maybe missed something? Do you think there's something back here that maybe his blood didn't cover that that maybe we need to go, because that's sometimes what we do. We, we go back and, and we start flipping up, you know, uh, carpets and we start looking in corners and, and, and in crevices and say, I know, I know there's probably something in here because it just doesn't seem like I'm, I'm free yet. And so it's probably under here. No, it's probably over here. So I need to look a little bit more. And what, what happens? We're in doubt and unbelief. 
Oh, come on. God's going to God's going to heal some generational curses in here this morning. He's going to stop that because we've been going around this mountain as Christians when the blood of Jesus paid for it completely. He didn't pay for it partially. His blood didn't didn't just get some of it. It got all of it. And I've watched this, I've watched this thing turn into a monster. I told you I'm not against deliverance. Yeah, people need to be set free, but when they get set free, they need to believe that they're free. Because otherwise the enemy will come back to you and say, well, you know, the reason, reason you still have that is because of this back here. I mean, the devil will never tell you that you're completely free. He's not going to. Have you ever been in a corporate review? Working for a corporation, they bring you in for a review, your performance review. And what do they do? They cross 10 out of 10 off of the list because nobody can attain that. So what, if you're an eight out of 10, you're you're good? What does that mean? I can, maybe I can be a six and still pass. But what if I, what if you really did a great job and didn't get the 10 out of 10? What if you were really there? I mean, in sports, there's 10 out of 10. Why not? Anyway, I'm sorry, it's a personal thing. But, but see, Jesus was 10 out of 10. covered all of it nothing left nothing broken nothing missing he got it all when he paid the price so what we're saying is if there's something still left over if there's still something back here if there's still something then we're saying his blood was not enough in essence is what we're saying Phil I need to see that in scripture okay I'm glad you asked first Peter chapter one turn over there if you have your Bible or it's going to be on the screen I'm going to read it to you out of the NLT 1 Peter 1 verse 18 notice what it says in the NLT it says for you know that God paid a ransom to save you from the empty life you inherited from your ancestors that sounds like a generational curse to me how about you I only got a couple of you on that but didn't that sound like a generational curse okay All right, that you inherited from your ancestors and it was not paid with mere gold or silver which was, uh, which loses their value, sorry. It was paid with the precious blood of Christ, the sinless, spotless lamb of God. So my forefathers' sin cannot step over the bloodline and taint my life if I'm born again. Whom the sun sets free. It's free indeed. Man, man. I, so here's my question. When are we going to believe this? How about just believing? Childlike faith, man. Childlike faith. You know, one of the reasons I love hanging around with people that haven't been saved for very long and are so on fire for God you know, is because of their childlike faith. Because I'm watching them going, man, I love, I love how in faith you are, man. I love how you just have this capacity to believe anything. That's, that's where we're supposed to be. Oh man, it gets me on fire to hang around with people that are on fire for God. We went to the sin last weekend and yeah, it was so good. And I, I was there with a bunch of people that are hungry for God. And I was so excited to be there. And we got on that front row and man, just the, the spirit of God's presence was just permeating the front there. And, and you know, Nicole and I are 16 years old at heart, but not physically. So we needed to go and get in the shade and get a drink, and get some ice. And, and uh, anyway, so when we moved into the shade, 
And we saw our group down there on the front row pressing in to the presence. The fire wasn't up there under the shade as strong. The presence wasn't as strong under the shade. Now I realized there were some there were some parents and they had kids and there was some of that going on. But but the passion and the hunger was not prevalent. And so I couldn't wait for the shade to finally get around to that side where we could move back down. And when we got back down to that front row, it was like, oh, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, God, your presence just permeating this place. Oh, it's so good. It was so good. I'm telling you, revelation changes everything, doesn't it? I want to read one more scripture and then we're going to pray. We're going to pray for a couple different groups this morning. Hebrews 13, verse 11 says this. It says, under the old system, the high priest brought the blood of animals into the holy place as a sacrifice for sin. And the bodies of the animals were burned outside the camp. So also Jesus suffered and died outside the city gates to make his people holy by means of his own blood. You've been made holy by the blood of Jesus. I I don't think you heard what I said. You have been made holy by the blood of Jesus. Phil, you don't understand. I mean, I, I, I got born again, but I, I mean, I've slipped and I've sinned a few times and, and you need to get back on the horse. I had a horse growing up. I got thrown off a bunch of times because I was 85 pounds soaking wet. I mean, that horse could buck me off in a heartbeat, but I always got back on her. Man, we need to get back on, back, back in the holiness that God paid the price for us to be. We, re, we do that by receiving it, receiving his forgiveness, receiving his uh, His. Uh, restoration of our life and his adoption as sons and daughters and not feel bad and realize that God's grace empowers us to be able to live out the holy life that he's called us to. Well, Phil, what are you saying? That's Paul. You're saying you live perfect? No, I'm not saying I live perfect, but I do flow in God's grace and I allow his grace to empower me and I go for it. I'm telling you, I'm going for it with everything that I have in me. And if I miss the mark, God is the kind of father that picks me up, dusts me back off and says, come on, get back in there.